Hello, everyone. Look down below. See the subscribe button? Go ahead and press it for me. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you. Welcome to Shannon Confidential. I am Shannon, your host. And Shannon Confidential is a podcast about life, love, and everything in between. And today's in between is going to be a blast. I am so excited. So if you grew up in the 80s like I did, you're going to have so much fun with today's episode. Chris Clues, he's the 80s pop culture guy. He's also a speaker and author of the 80s pop culture series books you see behind me. Well, basically, he has discovered a way to take 80s pop culture, the movies, everything that happened, every movie, and I'm telling you, he quotes them like the Bible, and how to make it work with, you know, the workplace and in life. There's morals, there's there's quotes, there's incentives, there's things, there's life lessons that we were taught in the 80s with these movies. And, you know, I got to tell you, I enjoyed them, never really thought about it as a life lesson. So his take on it, I thought was incredibly interesting. And of course, I grew up in the 80s. So I'm having a blast with this. But I didn't want to ask too many questions. I want to ask him all on air so all of you can hear his answers and just understand how he came about this because I think it's creative as hell. And I am so excited to introduce you to Chris Clues. All right, everybody, here he is, Chris Clues, the 80s pop culture guy. I'm telling you, when I say this, you quote 80s pop culture like the Bible. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually hysterical. And the best part is, is I get them all. So growing up in the 80s, I just... When I saw what you did and the books you wrote, I loved it. But then bringing the 80s into the workforce and all this other stuff and all the life lessons to be learned, I thought was brilliant. And they didn't just, that just didn't just pop up one day. So I want everybody, first of all, thank you for being on Shannon Confidential. It's Chris Clues. Yay! Uh, he's going to give thank us you. his journey and how we end up where he is. And we're just going to get into the nitty gritty. So have at it, Chris. Well, Shannon, thank you for having me. I, I always say this, that independent podcasters um, are the lifeblood of us independent authors and speakers and anybody who's doing something independent uh, because it's the great equalizer now, right? We have a megaphone. You provide that megaphone to us. Yeah. And I greatly appreciate that because I know the work that goes into actually creating a podcast. It's real easy to sit here, be a guest, talk about what I love, but what you do behind the scenes to actually create the podcast and all the work that goes into it, uh, I can tell you, I personally appreciate it. So thank you for the megaphone. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, like you said, I, I really, um, I'm so lucky to be in the position that I am today. Uh, I was, um, you know, my little bit about, about my background, I was in corporate marketing for 20 plus years okay. and uh, I, you know, listen, I like marketing, uh, but we talk about the difference between like and love in personal relationships. We talk about that a lot. You know, there's a lot of people that you dated throughout your life that you liked but there's very few people that you can say you loved. And I think that goes with our careers as well. And we don't talk about it enough when people say, oh, yeah, I like my job. There's a huge gap between like and love in, in, in your career, just like in your personal relationships. Good point. I really, Good point. yeah. I mean, I really like marketing. I really, really enjoy it. Um, I love what I do today. And it came to me because I was in a job that just kind of wasn't working out for me. I think we've probably all been there, I right? I was gonna say, who hasn't been there? Yeah. Yeah. And even though you like it, it's just whatever. It's not working out for you. So uh, I was having a self-pity party of one, we'll call it. And uh, it's the best way to do it, I guess. And I was uh, on my couch watching The Breakfast Club. For I'll the watch that. Time. I hope so. I hope so. It's, it's kind of one of the iconic 80s movies. So I really hope, and it really defines the 80s generation, I think, uh, in so many ways. So I was watching The Breakfast Club and Bender the criminal character, the juvenile delinquent, says, screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. And I had never really thought about that line before. But at that moment in my life, it resonated. So I kind of sat up on my couch and I thought, yeah, my screws have fallen out, right? I mean, that's kind of where I was. What am I going to do to put them back in? Am I going to just pick up those same screws and put them back in the exact same way and continue down that path that really wasn't working for me? Uh, or am I going to get a whole new set of screws and try something different? 
Uh, or maybe I'll get a whole new set of screws, a whole new door frame, a whole new door, and I'll walk out of that brand new door to a brand new journey. And that's what I did. That's amazing. That's like, that's cool. That's really cool. It, it was an that epiphany. That takes a lot of courage. I mean, Not a lot of people can do that. <laughs> well, the second part, I, and I appreciate that. And, you know, it gave me a whole new respect for people who do things on their own, entrepreneurs. And uh, the second part of it was probably the scarier part for me. Going out on my own was exciting. Um, but at the time in life that I did it, so I was 47 years old, um, not exactly, you know, the 35 year old or 25 year old, or even now 18 year old entrepreneur, I was 47 years old. Now I had a lot of experience, which was good because I could play off of it, but to go out on your own at that age, people said, oh no, you can't do that in your late forties. And it's nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it's nonsense. You know, so I was watching the outsiders, uh, another great eighties movie. I think, uh, I think my, you have quite the 80s collection. A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. I used to have a huge DVD collection, but those went away. So <laughs> I think I sold 300 of them for like $37. Oh my God. So that's, that's, awesome. that's how much they were that's worth. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was watching The Outsiders, has Patrick Swayze, one of my favorite actors of all time. My, my dog Bodie is actually named after his character oh, from Point Break. Patrick. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I have a great St. Patrick's Day shirt that has him on it. And it says, Happy St. Patrick Swayze Day. And that he's on it. It says, I like you know, that's about the best St. Patty's Day shirt I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get it. I mean, I, I love it. I, I don't tell people, I, I guess I've just told a lot of people, but I try to keep it to myself because then people see it. They're like, oh, man, that's a cool shirt. Uh, so I was watching The Outsiders and Johnny Cade, who was a character in The Outsiders, played by Ralph Macchio, he says, uh, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. And that also resonated with me at 47 years old. You still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. Uh, I put it on a coffee mug and I just and took off and I said, I'm going to do this. Yeah. I wear it on 4th of July. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. And I, you know, I, I really looked at those two lines, this screws falling out, my screws have fallen out. And I decided to write an article on what the breakfast club can teach us about problem solving. And I threw it out on LinkedIn and people responded. I, I was shocked at the amount of people that responded. I really just did it. It was more therapy for me. Like, let me get this out of my brain. Yeah. And uh, then I decided to write a little book. The first one you see behind you with the yellow cover uh, on this idea of what 80s pop culture teaches us about the workplace. 80 pages, really short. I, there's not a lot to it. Uh, I didn't just did it for fun. And my buddy helped me self-publish it on Amazon. Another great equalizer is the self-publishing world that allows any of us to write and publish a book. I'm so uh, glad you said that because I didn't even know that platform existed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. And it's a great equalizer because I had actually tried to get some things published 10 or 12 years ago. But, you know, the big publishing houses, they don't pay attention to you unless you have a name. And you have, how do you get a name? Well, exactly. You know, it's like, Jesus, help me out here. Yeah, yeah. So the self-publishing world is amazing and it's very easy to do. Uh, so I wrote this book, 80 pages, and uh, people responded. And after I realized that my friends and family had bought the book and now pe people that didn't know me were buying the book, that was a really cool moment for me. Um, and it was the catalyst for actually, I built a website. I positioned myself as a speaker. I'd been on stage as a kid, so I was comfortable being on stage and then people hired me to speak and I thought, uh oh, I better create some content to do yeah. the speaking thing. Yeah. Isn't it kind of neat though, when you have something that resonates with you and then you write a, you, you, you realize just from a post that there's other people who kind of get this and they kind of feel the way I do. Then you write a book and then complete strangers are buying your book. Doesn't it make that great big world a little less big and realize, wow, we all are kind of the, we all. A lot of us think the same way. We're not alone out there. Yes, we're definitely not alone out there. No, it's true. It's really true. It's to, to see that other people had this affinity for 80s pop culture. And, and, and not understood just people, it the same way. And understood it the same way. Or came to me afterwards and said, I never really thought about these movies in that context. And That's now I'm going back and I'm intro. watching them again. Yeah, yeah, in your intro, they were just great movies. And then after talking with you and seeing what you did... And I'm going back, looking at some of the movies, you know, doing the research with you. And I thought, oh, that is a great line. And, oh, that is a great line. So yeah. you opened my eyes to what I've already seen in a whole new way already. Well, I really appreciate that because, you know, growing up in the 80s, these were movies were meant to entertain us and they still absolutely do. 
But you get older and you start to go back and watch those movies again for entertainment and you look at them through a different lens. Uh, and so I wrote this second book. I got a small publisher for the second book. It's a much better book. It's 220 pages versus 80 pages for the first one. I learned a lot from writing the first one. The publisher helped me a great deal in building out the lessons so that it's 10 movies again, but just more in depth. And, uh, and so I sit here today in front of you with two books, uh, a third on the way, uh, keynote speaking across the country uh, and talking 80s pop culture. I mean, I just. And when you say talking, just so people understand, first of all, everything that Chris says today, his books, the links the, the, to, to get in touch with him for speaking, I'll make sure it's all in the show notes. Trust me, you'll be able to reach him. But when you say 80s pop culture, you're not just up on stage just quoting movies. You're, you're oh. using 80s pop culture in a relatable way, however it works with the crowd. That's whatever right. So the event you're speaking at. Go, can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically when I go to speak at a conference, I will theme my presentation around their theme, their event theme. Some, some, uh, some of the organizations that hire me or the, the associations that hire me, they'll hire me for a leadership event. So most of the lessons will be tied to leadership. Others may be workplace culture, just general workplace culture. I'll tie those lessons to workplace culture. Marketing communications, I've done events for marketing communications, have a lot of lessons from 80s movies for marketing and communications. So I really can create whatever is needed from the, the conference or the organizer uh, or, or the company themselves and theme it for their, their particular theme. So yeah. I, I just, I love it because first of all, there are movies that half the crowd has, has watched. Uh, and and then you make it fun and then you make it relatable. I have this, I have sat in front of a lot of speakers before. And I think sitting in front of you would be a blast. First of all, I get it. But it also, you do take lines from movies that do resonate once you see them in a different way. So I, I would have a blast. Uh, my question is, what about the different generations that didn't grow up in the 80s? It may not, but some of these movies they have to be familiar with. But if they're not, do they... Is it just more or less the quote that resonates with them? Or did you, do you find out that they go back and start watching these movies and you have a huge fan? That, that's a great question. I'm so glad you brought it up because um, I'm going to be speaking at an event in uh, Lexington, Kentucky in March. And they brought up that very question. How do we, how does your content resonate across generations? And so I do try to focus as much as possible on the iconic movies from the 80s when I speak. So Ferris Bueller, The Breakfast Club, Coming to America, you know, movies that most people know, even if you're, you know, in your early 20s, you've heard of the movie and you've, you've likely seen it because chances are your parents are probably like, hey, you're going to watch this movie with us. Yeah. Uh, so I do that as well as the lessons. The lessons and the quotes are really what resonate. So we'll talk about a little bit of those uh, lessons in a few minutes. And I think I can show how the lessons resonate for today's workplace, for your life, today, regardless of where they're coming from. Uh, what I'm doing is taking them and putting them into a package that hopefully you remember when the time comes, the situation comes where that particular lesson comes into play. Instead of just somebody kind of putting slides up and, and talking to you, I'm actually trying to tie it to a character or a movie. And then hopefully you say, oh, wait a minute, I remember when X or Y taught me about that. And I'm going to use that now because I can, I can relate it to what's happening today. That's probably the, the key word right there. Make it relatable. Relatable. Big word. Yeah, absolutely. Th that's, I, I can't, okay. So, all right. I don't want to jump in. I've got so many questions. But I'm going to let you, 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 yeah. if you want to go into lessons. I know you mentioned a third book. You're speaking. I have so many questions for you. So. Okay. <laughs> well, this is great. I love it. And I'll tell you just, I think one more thing about the cross-generational. So I'm going to bring up a lesson from a musician in the 80s that I think is a good example of how it can cross generations. But before I do that, talking about 80s pop culture and why 80s pop culture, what is it about 80s pop culture that continues to resonate today? Why is it that we're 41 years away from 1980? Um, we're, we're supposed to be beyond the nostalgia cycle for the 80s. Nostalgia comes in about 30 year cycles, but it's, it's actually getting stronger. If you see the songs that are being used on commercials, you yeah. see the sequels for movies that are coming out. Uh, Top Gun sequels coming out this summer. Ghostbusters Afterlife just came out. Beverly remakes. Hills Cop remakes. 4. Yeah, what's that? I said remakes. Remakes movies. Remakes of uh, songs. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. noticed that as well. Yeah. And a lot of now, the, what's cool is they're, they're actually slowing down on the remakes. And they're actually doing sequels, which is even better because it's really difficult to take 
a high profile character from the 80s and say, well, now this actor, or this actress is now this character. It doesn't really work, even if they're really, really good at it. So Top Gun coming out, Beverly Hills Cop 4 is being produced by Netflix with Eddie Murphy as Axel Foley, which is fantastic. That's awesome. And so you, the begs a question, why, why 80s pop culture? Why is it still resonating? And I think from a business perspective, a lot of the people making the decisions that have the purse strings are 80s, kids of the 80s, and they want, they're kind of nostalgic for that time. But I also think in talking to these audiences and talking to people in their 20s, that there, there's, there was this explosion of creativity in the 80s, like nothing we've seen before. I explained it as, as like a glitter bomb. You took a glitter bomb, threw it against a wall, and all these colors came out. And, and that was all of the different things that happened, all the creativity in the 80s. Uh, that is a very, very good, good job out of you. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's, it was a glitter bomb, I guess. I don't know. I've never thrown a glitter bomb against the wall, but I would assume that a lot of cool colors would come out. And Yeah, and I mean, that's, you know, I feel like that's what happened in the 80s, that we just had this explosion of creativity. And the other thing that happened in the 80s was, well, you took these genres that existed and they splintered into all of these other little genres. There was something for everyone. If you take hip hop, for example, hip hop was just, you know, Grandmaster Flash in the late 70s, but then we get into the 80s and you see it's not just hip hop as a genre, but there's rap, there's dance, there's the hip hop, there's R&B, there's gangster rap, there's house, there's club, all just from one genre, you have now seven different genres that all talk to different people. And so these groups of people said, that's for me, that's for me. And the same thing happened with movies. The romantic comedy was, you know, around. I mean, you had some like it hot, I think, back in the 50s. I mean, there was definitely romantic comedies, but they exploded yes. in the 80s. And, and they and had they these... threw in humor. And they threw in humor, right. And great characters. And then you had, with the romantic comedies, you had the coming-of-age movies inside of romantic comedies, movies like Fast Times at Ridgemont High or... The Last American Virgin, or on and on and on, that all had tied back, some of those tied back to kind of romantic comedies. There was something going on inside of the movie. So, yeah, I think that happened because 80s pop culture, the 80s was the last time the pop culture wasn't manufactured. Um, and what I mean by that is a little bit in the, the like early to mid 90s, but around the mid 90s, they started packaging up the pop culture, spending a lot of money before they released it. And so they pounded us over the head and said, you're gonna like this musician, you're gonna like this song, you're gonna like this movie, like it, like it, like it, like it, like it, because we need to get our money back. Okay. And in the 80s, they took a lot of chances. There were a lot of risks. They didn't know, and they didn't have an international box office like we do today. They had the domestic box office, a video store, if you were lucky 12 months later, your movie came out in the video store, and maybe you got on HBO if you were a really big movie. Um, and that happened a year later, two years later. But that was it. You know, so, I never really noticed or looked at it that way. It, you're so right. It you had to tell a great a story. Different world. It was a different world. And you had to tell a great story and you had to have great characters or people didn't care. And so I think when you talk to people in their 20s, uh, I'll tell you a great story about um, someone who asked me about a shirt I had on. And you talk to people in their 20s and they say, yeah, you know, the, the, a lot of the, the characters and the storylines, they seemed a lot more raw, which was a good thing because they weren't so produced, overproduced. You didn't have CGI where if your movie was terrible, you could say, well, let's just take the, the last 30 million we have in our budget and create really cool special effects and then people want to see it in the theater. Didn't have special that. Special effects are like poltergeist. <laughs> right, which was awesome. At but, the time, you know, yeah. <laughs> by today's standards, right? But what was cool was that those were actually being created physically on a set. They weren't being created on a computer. And there's something to be said for that. This, this rawness in these 80s movies and music. I challenge anybody to go back to any week of any month of any year in the 80s. Ninth, you know, third week in June, 1987. Go look at the top 40. Look at the top 20. You have literally something for everyone. You would have LL Cool J next to Motley Crue, next to Depeche Mode, next to Kenny Rogers, Debbie Gibson, and we'll throw in like, uh, I don't know, Christopher Cross, right? <laughs> so here you got all of these different groups represented. And not to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, but if I look at the top 40 today, there, if there's a genre that's popular, everybody's doing it because they want to make their money. They want to get in. 
Some of them just get out really fast, but it's, hey, what's hot and let's do it. Back then it was, this is what I do and I like it and I want to put it out there and see if you like it. You're so right. Everybody sounds the same now. Everybody is copying. You get one movie and then <clears throat> you get a bunch of people that try to make a spinoff of that same type of movie. Back in the 80s, it was just a bunch of different movies, a bunch of different songs, a bunch of different kinds of uh, music. And everybody kind of just gravitated to what they like. Now you just kind of have to like what's out there or you just don't yeah. like anything or you just go back and watch your movies. <laughs> that you That's right. And and yeah, I mean, it's it's and so... <clears throat> I was in the grocery store about, um, oh, I think it was a year ago on 4th of July with a buddy and his girlfriend and we were getting some stuff for, for cookout and I had a breakfast club shirt on. And this will your tell you all you need to- has to be a riot. What's that? I said your wardrobe has to be a riot. I, it's all 80s movie t-shirts. That's all I wear. That's it. I mean, I have this Karate Kid one on right now, old school Karate Kid. Um, so, I went you know, fluorescent. <laughs> I, I like the fluorescent. It reminds me of uh, like um, uh, jams. I think jams were like super bright colors. And, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sorry I interrupted you. So no, you're, neon, you're neon and fluorescent were like the, 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 they were the colors. And they had the ones that you could like touch and it turned different colors. It was like, oh yeah, yeah the nail polish, the whole deal. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I had colored I lines in my hair. It's a whole nother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so we were in the grocery store and we come up and the girl who's bagging our groceries looks at my shirt, my breakfast club shirt, and says, that's my favorite movie. And I said, ah, really? And she said, yeah. And I said, can I ask, how old are you? And she said, I'm 15. And I said, Ho hold on a second. <laughs> I was 15 when this movie came out in 1985. This is your favorite movie. And she said, yeah. And I said, can, can I ask you, I'm very curious, can I ask you why? And she said, my friends and I all love it. We love all of the movies from the 80s, but particularly the high school ones. And I said, why is that? And she said, because they were real and they were authentic and the, the, the kids in the movie in the breakfast club in particular had the same problems that we have. Exactly. And they talk, Life hasn't yeah. really changed. It really hasn't. And, and they talked openly about them. And I said, but what about today's movies? Don't they do that? And she said, no, the high school movies, the girls look like they're 30. The guys have hundred thousand dollar cars. They drive up to the high school with, they're just not realistic. That's not us. And it's not the problems that we have. The problems that they talk about in the high school movies today are not the problems that we have. And I thought that was a really interesting take. Now, that's just one person, right? But it speaks to maybe why 80s pop culture continues to resonate. To keep coming back. Yeah. Great storytelling, great characters. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's just, again, that's just one story. But, but it, it and if you look at it. If you look at the the stars that came out in in the eighties, all those movies, all the all the let us say classic movies or or however you want to word it, those guys, the Patrick Swayze's, they just stood the test of time. They just kept being successful and success. All the movies that came out, you know, to to today, those I remember when you know you go back and they look like little kids in the movies, but they were that good back then. That's why they're they're. They've been able to stand the test of time. They're still in movies today because they were so good back then. Yeah. That's how, that's what I think. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, they, they've had a lot of them have had very long careers that got started uh, in the eighties and uh, TV shows like they're everything. Uh, yeah. And they're still, they were, they were our people. Yeah. And they were, you know, again, these stories were uh, the characters and the stories and the content it was all designed I, to tell a great story. It wasn't designed to necessarily wow you. Although there were movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark, awesome action adventure. I mean, Spielberg had some great action adventure movies. Yeah. Um, Back to the Future was a great a kind of adventure, I guess you would call it movie. But so many of them were really designed to just tell great stories. And I, I, I don't wanna say that we've completely lost that today. But I do think that if you look at the big box office hits and the ones that really do well, they tend to be the large special effects, Marvel, DC comic movies. And some of those are cool, but I don't know that we're telling the great stories anymore. And I think, again, that's why so many of these movies are still resonating today, why people are going back and why shows like Stranger Things became such a huge hit because it was pulling from so much of what the 80s had to offer. It's why Cobra Kai is a massive hit, you know, pulling from the Karate Kid. And so 
Uh, I also think that if I wanted to learn in the 80s, the early to mid 80s, if I wanted to know about Led Zeppelin from the 70s, like what is Led Zeppelin? I want to know what it is. I had to ask the guy sitting on his T-top Camaro with the, <laughs> with the jeans jacket and a Led Zeppelin patch, smoking a cigarette. And you know what I wasn't going to do? I wasn't asking him, no. what is Led Zeppelin? Right? I, just, I wasn't going to do that. I'm not walking up to that guy. Today, kids, if they watch Stranger Things and they hear a song, I don't know, by the Psychedelic Furs, and they type in the Psychedelic Furs in Google, and they go down this incredible rabbit hole suddenly they can see, oh, you like the Psychedelic Furs? Here's some music that sounds like that. Uh, you like the song Pretty in Pink by the Psychedelic Furs? Did you know that that was a movie? Here's that movie. And by the way, here are a bunch of movies that are like Pretty in Pink. And did you know that those movies were actually created by the same guy, John Hughes? And suddenly they know as much about the 80s as we do. That's true. That's true. They and I think that's part of it. Technology has kicked that into high gear. Yeah, the inf information is at your fingertips. So... Yeah. And, and when you talked about, you know, the girl at, that was doing, you know, checking out your groceries. One thing about the eighties, what a lot of those movies, probably more or less the high school movies, but they were, they were relatable. They were, they showed the clicks in high school. The clicks exist. That's yeah, just a fact. And everybody watching that movie at one point was one of those clicks. Not that clicks are bad. I, and they, you know, being girls, whatever, that it will always exist over time, but yeah. it just showed everybody could watch each movie because somewhere, even like the breakfast club, you were one of those people in detention, whether you liked it or not. And I oh, know yeah. I, I got, I had weekend detention sometimes. So I really understood that. And even how they make the, the, you know, in some of these movies, they even make the principal or the teachers or, you know, the, the PE coaches or whatever that are watching or watching you during your, your Saturday detention, corny and weird because they were, they were to us back then, you know, that's just it. And I think that that's what resonates is how relatable some of those movies were. And then I think the songs bring us back to a time where things made sense. So there's like, it's like home, home food, home cooking, you know, it's a comfort. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. A comfortable pair of jeans. Yeah. And, and you know, the, you said the breakfast club, I think all of us were probably all five of those characters at some point <laughs> in our lives. I mean, if you think about. I didn't say I was necessarily ever a criminal, but I get it. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, there was probably something that you did that, you know, was a little like, I, we all did something when we were teenagers and yeah. So, uh, but I will say you're right. I mean, the music, so let's talk about a musician actually. And we, you mentioned the cross-generational thing. So I have a lesson that I talk about, a leadership lesson, and it comes from a musician who loved the color purple. If you can guess who I that know, is. I where you're going with this. Okay, yeah. So Prince is a guy who I think most people know. Even, you know, I would imagine, I don't have kids, but I would imagine... I mean, my friends who have 11 and 12 year old kids, they know Prince. They know who Prince is. They know his music and they like it. Most people like his music. So he's a great example of somebody who crosses generations. Now, in 1987, he was the king of music. Uh, he had, had Purple Rain underneath of him already, had been nominated for Academy Awards, Grammys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On and on. And he sick was talent. just getting sick talent. Ridiculous. And just getting started, by the way but had already, it was already the biggest in the world. I mean, Michael Jackson, they say he was the king of pop. That's fine. But Prince was the king of music. I mean, he was writing music for the Bangles, Manic Monday. He That's wrote, what a lot of people don't realize is how much he did for others. Yeah, right. Nothing compares to you for Sinead O'Connor. Um, I actually think he wrote that. And then I don't think he wrote that for her. I think he had wrote that previously. And then she ended up using it. Yeah. Nothing compares to you. Um, obviously composed all of Purple Rain. Um, he was doing some stuff with a symphony. He was playing all kinds of instruments. I mean, listen, he was just massive, huge. And Suzanne Vega was an alt singer in 1987. Now I knew her because I was listening to college radio at the time. And I kind of, I was digging like some of the stuff I was hearing. She had one song called Left of Center that was on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. Okay. And then she had a song called My Name is Luca. Uh, I live on the second floor. I live upstairs from you. Yeah. I know so exactly really, how you're talking about yeah, yeah, really powerful song, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 1987, she was, you know, I mean, you if you knew her, you, you were listening to college radio, essentially. But Prince, again, was the king of music at the time, 1987. So she puts out the song, My Name is Luca. Prince hears it. He's so moved by it 
that he actually penned a handwritten note to her. And the note, yeah, yeah, awesome. And the note said, Dear Suzanne, Luke is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince. It's pretty awesome, right? I have goosebumps just trying to imagine what she felt like receiving that. Well, that's part of the lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Can you imagine? Like the person that you, you know, the person who is at the top of your industry has taken the time to write you a handwritten note that's, to let you know about an accomplishment. <laughs> right. A lost start, by the way. Handwritten notes are a lost start. And uh, if you if you look up the note online, you can see it. And it's, his handwriting is magical. It's beautiful handwriting. He's using numbers for words. Before, I, I mean, before text messaging, I wonder if he was like a time traveler too. I mean, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me one bit at all. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, and so he writes this, you know, this handwritten note. Now it's 1987. He can't email this to her. There's no digital means to get it to her. Somebody has to get it to her. Either he has to hand deliver it, somebody in his entourage, but one way or the other, there was an extra step that needed to be taken in order for her to receive this note from him. And, um, and so she gets it. And that yeah. says a lot because he had to go pretty much out of his way to make sure she gets it. It yeah. wasn't, like you said, couldn't just write an email or couldn't just send a text message. He had to say, I need to get, I'm going to write a letter to this woman and I'm going to make sure she gets it because I want her to read it. There's like, like you said, there's extra steps to be taken. So just, he actually went out of his way, which is something people don't do anymore, but kudos to Prince. Yeah, pretty awesome. And so we know that he wrote this note because in 2016, when he passed away, Suzanne Vega put it out on her social media to let people know the kind of guy Prince was behind the scenes. Uh, because he didn't talk about that stuff. You know, he wasn't that guy. You know, he just didn't. I'm sure there was a lot more that he did that we don't know about, but that wasn't his thing. Like his thing was not about like, hey, look what I'm doing. He's not a self-promoter. Um, he just did it. And so... What did he teach us here? Well, he taught us the difference between leaders and rulers. So when rulers get the stage of success, uh, they tend to keep everybody below it. They don't want anybody up there with them. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is a lot of times rulers are placed on that stage. They didn't earn it. They didn't earn their way up there. They're just positioned up there, you know, whether it's through nepotism or, you know, whatever, a, a lot of different ways that they can actually become a ruler. And they keep everybody below the stage because they're not confident in their abilities. They, rulers typically don't want people to challenge them or question them. They certainly don't want somebody up on that stage who could actually have some talent. Because it would expose well, them. Well, because they usually lack it, right? That's you know, why they're a ruler. So they keep everybody below it. Leaders share the stage of success. Yeah. Prince was on the biggest stage in the world. And he took the time to say, hey, greatness, I see you. I see you doing great things. There's room up here on this stage for you. You know, keep going. That's beautiful. Yeah. That is a, that's a wow life lesson. Well, I mean, I, I, I just, I think when I read the note, my first instinct was he was letting her know that she was great as well and that she should continue to work at her craft because she could be up on that stage with him. And that he was willing to share it was the other thing. He's willing to share that stage with her and say, hey, I see you, greatness. I see what you're doing. And, uh, and yeah, there's room up here for you. Because he had, earned that. That, he had earned that position on that stage. When you earn that position, you're not afraid of anybody else. You're not, you, you encourage other you people. Because, yeah, you, you earned it, but you encourage other people because you realize the work that you had to do. And when, and, and when you see talent, when you're talented and you see talent, you want to let them know. You recognize it and you want to let them know. So. That's, and I, 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 first of all, I want to thank you. I never did hear that story. I've heard a lot of great stories about how really incredible Prince was and, um, you know, the different things he did in, in his life. But I've never heard that one. So first, I'd like to sh thank you for sharing that with all of us because that's that's just kind of kind of something like kind hearted that you can just take throughout your day, you know, and a life lesson for anybody, you know, yeah. leaders share. Yeah, leaders different. share the stage. And, and, and the other lesson he taught us was that encouragement doesn't cost a thing. So that was the big lesson out of this as well, is that we can all encourage somebody every single day. It can be somebody you know, it can be somebody you work with, somebody in your personal life, it can be a stranger. 
but we can encourage somebody every single day. It doesn't cost a thing. It's free to encourage somebody. Anybody can do it. It's so true. I, I've, if I pass somebody, I don't know, say somebody is dressed nice, you know, what have you, and I give them a compliment. Do you know that the look of shock that I usually get because I think people like for a second don't really realize I just said something nice to them because that, like you just said, the words of encouragement, something positive, it costs nothing yet. It's done so infrequently that when you yeah. do do it, people are shocked. And that's kind of a sad way to look at it, but it also makes me want to do that more often, spread that joy, spread that kindness more often because it, it does cost nothing. And it means so much to the person who received it, just like it did for Susan, when she posted that note, it truly all those years later meant that much to her still. Yeah. Yeah. So, so from a simple handwritten note, um, Prince taught us that leaders share the stage and that encouragement doesn't cost a thing. And that the handwritten note is a lost art. Again, something very easy to do rather than send somebody an email, send them a handwritten note, let them know. And uh, you took the time to do that. Now, I don't, my handwriting is terrible. So if I send a handwritten note to somebody, I also have to follow up with an email that says <laughs> exactly what the note says. Yeah, here's the translation. Uh, but yeah, that, and that's just a, an example of a cross-generational person from the 80s. I mean, he was more, you know, from everywhere, but really from the 80s. Uh, and how that person can teach us some valuable lessons that would also resonate with somebody, whether you're 20 or you're 70. Very well said. Yes, it would. That is a great example. Thanks. Yeah. So that's just an example of, you know, how, how I can take 80s pop culture. And I mean, I have a lot more um, from movies as well. So uh, we can talk about whatever you'd like. What, what, is, uh, what is your favorite? What is your, is your favorite quote also your favorite lesson? No, it's actually not. And it would be hard for me to pin my favorite quote because I have so many from the 80s. Uh, and I actually try to look for quotes that, I can't do this with every movie, but as much as I can, I try to find quotes that, that weren't the ones that people quote from the movie. Uh, always, I mean, you can't always do that, but uh, there are some, like, for example, when I said, you know, the, the screws fall out all the time, the world's an imperfect place. If you ask somebody to to quote that their top five quotes in the breakfast club, probably not in there. There's, there's other quotes that people remember. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I, I think probably my favorite is because it comes from a guy, from a character that you just would not expect to teach you anything about life, about the workplace, nothing. Because he was a stoner surfer dude um, from a fantastic coming of age movie high school coming of age movie. Uh, he wore Vans, if that gives you any idea. I know who you're talking about. Okay, good. Yeah, Jeff Spicoli, right? From Fast Times at Ridgemont High, a guy that you would not expect to teach you, teach us anything. I mean, you know. Because of the role he was playing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he walked in a class with his shirt unbuttoned and a bagel in his pants. Like, I mean, what, else, what is this guy going to teach us? Like, he's just... So, uh, but he taught us quite a bit actually. And, and I love Fast Times because there are a lot of great lessons in it. And also we got introduced to some great actors and actresses like Forrest Whitaker had a great, had a small role in Fast Times and went on obviously to be Forrest Whitaker, Sean Penn, Jennifer Jason Lee, Phoebe Cates, Judge Reinhold. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Cameron Crowe wrote it. He was 24 and he actually went undercover in a high, in a, uh, a high school in LA to write the movie. So all the characters are based on real characters from this high school that he went undercover in. I love um, that. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. And Amy Heckerling directed it, who directed Clueless, which was kind of like a 90s yeah. version of Fast Times. So there's a lot of cool stories behind the, the actual movie itself. And then you mentioned earlier about how we talk about the teachers and um, the people that, that kind of ran the detention and we thought they were weird. But then you look back and you think like, Actually, that was a pretty good teacher. And yeah. th Mr. Hand in Fast Times, I think at, as a teenager, I'm like, oh my God, that's the worst teacher ever. As an adult, I look back, I'm like, every teacher should be like that guy. I was going like, to say, he, he was awesome. He was awesome. Yeah. But not when you were a kid. You know, he was so strict. And, and But he was trying to teach them he, American history. <laughs> yes. 
and he yeah. incredibly patient. But yeah, he actually, when you look at it again, like you say, look at it through a different lens, um, looking back at some of those, you kind of would have been like, oh man, I wish he was my teacher, you know, which at the time, yeah. you know, but that's just hindsight. Hindsight. Yeah. And so, and also age and, you know, wisdom, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I, I wouldn't call that goes in there. wisdom for me, but you know, um, but we look back, you know, fondly on Mr. Hand. Now, Mr. Hand and Spicoli had a really interesting relationship. Uh, you know, Spicoli was always late to class and Mr. Hand hated tardiness. And so we see this bubble up to the surface when Spicoli comes in late to class again. And, and Mr. Hand says, Spicoli, why are you always late to my class? And Spicoli says, I don't know. And Mr. Hand says, I like that. I don't know. And he puts the three words, I don't know, on the chalkboard. And he says to Spicoli, I'm going to leave your words up here for all my classes to read. And I'm going to give you full credit, of course. And Spicoli says, well, all right, because he's never gotten credit for anything in school. Mr. Hand just shakes his head. He can't believe it. Like, how is this guy proud of the fact that he said, I don't know. And I'm going to leave this up here for my classes. Yeah. So my question is, how many times in your life or in the workplace, have you been asked a question and you didn't know the answer? A lot. We all have, right? Yeah. A lot. Now, if there's somebody out there who's like, never, I knew, I know every answer. Well, then in the words of the church lady from Saturday Night Live, in that special, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, you know all the answers, you're omnipotent, good for you. Yeah. But let's talk about the average normal person who doesn't, who, who doesn't have the answer to everything. And so a lot of us have been in that position in our, in our careers, in our jobs. And we've always been taught that saying, I don't know, is a sign of weakness or vulnerability. What do you mean you don't know the answer? You should know every answer to every question. How come you don't know the answer? Yeah. So what do people do? They would make it up. And before the internet, I suppose you could get away with that for a certain amount of time. Uh, but you can't now. And so we've been taught this idea that saying, I don't know, means you don't know your job. How dare you? You don't know the answer. And I say nonsense. I think it's a sign of strength and confidence and character to say, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's transparent and honest, which is something we need a lot more of today, transparency and honesty. <clears throat> and, um, and so it shows some strength and character that you're willing to admit that you don't know. Uh, like now, that. now, there's also this idea that people can kind of fact check you in these days. And if you Allegedly. are a leader... <laughs> Allegedly. Well, yeah, you know, but I can at least go online. I can say, or, you know, maybe, maybe there's information available, available to me for my job that wasn't in the eighties or the ninety, even the nineties. And so, uh, if, if I'm a leader and I make something up and my team finds out, well, you lose credibility. Yeah. If you're a team member and you make something up and people find out, you're also going to lose credibility from your leader and from other people on the team. And if you're in a very regulated compliant industry, like the finance industry or the pharmaceutical industry, you better not make something up. It's going to create a whole host of problems. I was head of marketing for a number of years in the financial industry. And I can tell you, you know, the compliant and regulatory aspect of the, of that industry is large and real. And you, you've got to stay within those lines. And so there's a lot, there's a, a lot more that can happen than just somebody saying, you know, I found out what you were saying was inaccurate. Yeah. So it's really important from a business perspective as well. Now, I want to tell you that when you say, I don't know, you want to caveat it with a, let me get back to you. I'll get the say. answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because that you just don't want to leave it fine. If you don't know, that's fine. But that's yeah. not, you got, I'm asking, I need help here. Help me out. Yeah. 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 Let me get the answer. So you want to caveat it with, let me get the answer. I'll get back to you. Give me a minute. Give me a, you know, a day, whatever it is that you need to, to get back to the person. You don't want to leave it hanging out there because that, as Seinfeld said to Costanza, when uh, Costanza said, you know, I think I'm going to tell this girl that I love her. I'm going to say, I love you. And Seinfeld said, well, are you sure that you're going to get the return? I love you. Because if you don't, that's a pretty big matzo ball hanging out there. <laughs> and uh, if you don't get the, if you don't, if you just leave it with, I don't know, that's a pretty big matzo ball hanging out there. So you definitely want to say, I'll get back to you. Let me get the answer. Um, but the idea of saying, I don't know, uh, is a sign of strength and confidence and character to admit that. And that's I, Jeff Spicoli teaching us. I, I, I see how you're doing all the life lessons in the eighties pop culture. I have to tell you, brilliantly done Chris Clues this is well, really thank you <laughs> it's I not that I doubted you but hearing your examples 
of the way you, you could work that in if you were speaking to, you know, this group or that group or this company, I get it. And it's brilliantly done. Well, thanks. My, you yeah, should tell my teachers because I don't think a single one of them ever called me brilliant through high school, through college. <laughs> they didn't yeah. know what they had. Let's just, say. I didn't know that I you had this later in life. <laughs> yeah. 25 years later, I figured it out. Who cares? This so. still could happen. It's never yeah. too late. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me because I, I really love this, this stuff. I love this content and to hear people hear it resonate with people. It's kind of surreal for me. You mentioned the word relatable earlier and I'm just, you know, I tell people when I get on stage, look, I'm just a big goofball. I'm, I'm a knucklehead. I, I, I love eighties pop culture. I understood enough about the business world to be dangerous and I, I wanted to talk about 80s pop culture and I tried to figure out a way to do it. And I put these two together and somehow it worked. And so I'm up here on stage. I'm not going to teach you. I'm not, we're not going to be walking across hot coals today. Okay. That's not what I do. And I'm certainly not going to tell you how to be like me. I don't want anybody, you know, you be you. Uh, but I will tell you that I hope that, I, that at the end of this conversation, that you feel like you could do this too, that you could get up here and do what I do because ultimately I believe you can. And so, you know, I want to be relatable and I am just a big knucklehead who had an idea and ran with it. And so, um, that, that right that there word. is a whole inspirational lesson, just you alone. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, like I said, I, I don't have this like uh, big pedigree background. I don't, I don't, you know, have these, I, I mean, I guess I have accomplishments, so to speak, but I don't have these massive accomplishments. I mean, I wasn't a CEO of a big company. Um, you know, I didn't go to an Ivy League school. I don't have all these, these things behind me. I just, like I said, I came up with an idea and I tell people that, you know, with this idea of you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want from the outsiders. I say, look, how much free time do you have during the day, during the week? Not much, right? None of us have a ton of free time. But if you find that free time, that, that, that really valuable free time being captured by the same hobby or interest or passion, you know, that every time you have free time, you're like, I want to do that. And you go do it. That's what was happening with me. Uh, I loved writing. I loved 80s pop culture. And I found a lot of my free time revolved around that. And so I tell people, if you find that, then, hey, listen, if you have a hobby or interest or passion that's taking up all that free time, maybe it's time to go create you. Maybe it's time to go find, take what you have, what you love, your passion, and find a way to generate revenue from it. Find a way to, to generate a career from it. And we talk about the side hustle, right? Well, it starts with that. Yes. I did it. I'm podcasting. I was, this is me doing that. Podcasting. Yeah. Right. Exactly. What you're doing. It starts out as a side hustle. You've got to be willing to say that I'm going to put in the time and the work but it won't feel like work if it's something that you love. If, it, if, it's, if you're doing it during your free time, it's not work. Yeah. And, um, and then maybe that free time becomes what you do. So it almost feels like free time all the time because you're doing what you love. And so I, I, I am with you on that. I wake up every day and I am editing uh, graphics, talking to people, intro calls, learning how to do lighting, learning all the recording. And I love it. Sometimes I feel like my brain's going to explode, but yeah. I love every second of it. Yeah, me too. Me as well. I mean, I absolutely love this. And, and I tell people that. I say, you can go create you. You can go do this thing. You just have to be willing to say, what's the investment I'm willing to make? And so I was you know, working as a head of marketing at a division of DHL, and I was traveling quite a bit. My, my free time at night on weekends, it didn't matter. Like it was dedicated to building this. And so, you know, I gave up a lot of things that I enjoyed, but I realized that those things were taking up my time and they weren't really helping me produce who I wanted to be. And so I made that, that change and that shift. And now I get to do those things and do what I love. So there you go. Um, you love it. Yeah. I, I love it. I I think it's great. You had mentioned that you, where did you say you were speaking next? Uh, well, I have a couple of speaking gigs coming up locally, but um, I just yesterday found out that I booked um, a keynote speaking engagement in Lexington, Kentucky in March, uh, early March. And so the speaking gigs are coming in. Uh, I have one next Friday down here in Fort Lauderdale. I have one oh. on January 14th. So it's my neck of the woods. 
Yeah, yeah. So they're coming in and um, people are gathering again. They're excited to get back together. And that's great for me, uh, of course, for people wanting to get back together. And they also want something lighthearted and fun. Yeah. And I think I can provide that. So, so, you know, I can hopefully teach some lessons, but at the same time, have a lot of fun doing it. And um, again, to not take myself seriously or your life too seriously and, um, and really just kind of enjoy the time you have because um, it's short. I found that out this year on several occasions. So um, you got to just kind of embrace it while you have it. And um, whether, you know, we get another turn around or not, who knows, but you're not going to remember this one. So <laughs> um, got to have fun while you're here. You got to just, yeah. I mean, you got to do what you love and, and, and don't wait to do that. I mean, I, I'd like to think that if I would have done this 10 years prior, I, you know, maybe, but I don't know if I was ready. And I um, just did, you know, sometimes it, it, whether you said you were doing it in your forties, I started doing this in my late, I went to college and back to college in my late forties. And, and now I'm doing this, I'm in my fifties. It's never too late. So yeah. it is what it is on that one. Just don't, you know, I just didn't want to sit around being, I didn't want to just like something. I wanted to love it. So now I love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, and that's exactly how I am as well. And I mean, I get to watch these movies again and then try to find the lessons in these movies. And I absolutely love doing that. Um, you know, you talk to a lot of different audiences and uh, a, a movie that's, that's going to be everybody's going to be watching here over the next month is Christmas Vacation. Just watched it. <laughs> Just watched it. Okay. Just watched it. So you know Clark uh, has his little rant when he gets the Jelly of the Month Club. I want to get me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of his Christmas bonus, and you know, cousin Eddie says about the Jelly of the Month Club. Well, that's that's gift that keeps on giving all the year long, Clark. Uh, so yeah. He goes on his little rant and he says a lot of things. And one of the things he says is that he wants his boss, Mr. Shirley, brought, brought from his holiday slumber on Melody Lane with all the other rich people. He wants them brought right here with a red bow on him. <laughs> now, he's angry, of course, and he's not, doesn't really mean that he wants that to happen. But Cousin Eddie is part of the audience that he's talking to. And Cousin Eddie is, has a big Cousin heart, Eddie. but he's not that bright. And so he takes Clark literally. And what does he do? He goes and kidnaps Mr. Shirley and brings him to the house with a big red bow on him. That's what he does. And of course, Clark is like, oh my God, what are you doing? And he's like, well, you know, basically like, this is what you told me to do. No, 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 I was just, you know, I was angry. I was upset. And of course it leads to SWAT coming in the house and all the other things. But what we were taught there was to know your audience. You know, whether your audience is three or 300,000, Know your audience, know who you're talking to, to the best of your ability. You're never going to know everybody in that audience and how they're going to react. And they may surprise you with the way they react to your messaging. You can learn from it, of course. I'm sure Clark did learn from it. <laughs> you know, you want to make sure to learn from it. But of course, it's important to know your audience because they are going to interpret your, your, your message differently depending on their background, where they're from, what they've been through, their situation, their age, etc. Um, they're going to, they could interpret your, your message differently. And it's important to know your audience. Yet another lesson from Chris Clues. <laughs> a Christmas vacation lesson. Yeah. A holiday <laughs> lesson. Great. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I, we could probably sit here for hours doing this because they are, are truly, I mean, just researching you, you've got a lot out there. Uh, so which leads to my next question. You have book three, which technically, well, I guess it would be book three in this series. But you have the uh, that other coffee book, but we'll, we'll mention that in a second. What yeah. do you put in a third book? Uh, well, this one is actually, so the first two books had 10 movies from the 80s and what they teach us about the workplace. Uh, the third one is actually going to have 12 movies and it's going to teach, well, 11 movies and a musician that we talked about. And it's actually going to um, teach us about the workplace and life. So workplace and life lessons from 80s pop culture. So the same general idea, just a little more about life inserted in there in terms of the lessons. I want to broaden the audience a little bit more than just the workplace. Okay. And uh, I'll have some, some movies that I actually loved that were underrated in the 80s that maybe you've seen, maybe you haven't, but hopefully 
this will encourage you to see those movies, movies like Three O'Clock High, which had a great lesson about bullying well before its time. Uh, really, really awesome movie. Probably the best bully in movie history, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to actually include a movie um, that is very, uh, we'll call it, I guess, more of like the female genre. Um, Steel Magnolias will be in this book. Okay. Um, so I think there's a lot of great life lessons in there. And then some of the more traditional movies that people know from the 80s as well. Uh, like Cocktail, for example, will be in there, which is a fantastic movie. Uh, and so I'm going to take these movies and this one musician, I'm going to do the same thing. We're going to dive into these lessons, but we're going to tie in uh, life lessons as well from, from these movies also. And, and one thing that you'll learn, everybody, when you start to read these books, and I would imagine nothing's going to change when you go to your third book, you, may, you've, you feel like you're having a conversation with Chris. He writes like he's speaking to you it's not like you know very assertive and and structured he it, it's you're having a conversation with the paper so you'll it when i say an easy read it's a compliment because you really truly feel like you're 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 on the other side of the book talking back it's you are a, you are relatable so much that way you are very very enjoyable i i giggle you're funny you're really funny oh well thanks i i, I appreciate it. it means a lot to me because I do want it to be a conversation. Um, this isn't about, like I said before, this isn't about you know, me on stage or in my book saying, Here, you know, here's what you need to do. It's, it's, a, it's supposed to be a conversation. Self-deprecating humor is the best humor. Um, there's a lot that I can pull from my life that is making fun of me. And I, I, I enjoy doing that because I look back and laugh at some of the ridiculous stuff I did as well. And I want to share that. Uh, and it also helps set set the time, the, the, the time for each movie. You know, it's important to let people know what was the context. You mentioned uh, cross-generational for somebody who wasn't around the 80s. What's the context behind this? Help me understand that, that, that time period, that time frame with other pop culture and also, you know, what you were doing in your life at that time. What was I doing at that time in my life? Uh, and so I, I enjoy doing that and I'm glad to hear that it's conversational because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. When, when do you expect that to be coming out? When can we watch for it? Well, uh, probably late spring. So likely in May, I have a little bit of a deadline that I'm behind on that I have to uh, start working a little faster on um, getting some of these chapters done uh, because I was playing around with some of the movies a little bit and trying to decide uh, on a two or three movies that I wasn't sure of. Uh, okay. One that I'm considering, and I'm not sure yet, is a movie called Lucas, which was a Great movie again, really great lessons about bullying and um, great cast with Corey Haim and Charlie Sheen and amongst others. So um, really underrated movie. But yeah, that hopefully in uh, late May. Okay. Well, everybody, like I said, if you look down in the show notes, everything linked up to Chris Clues with his books, his website, his, his social media, how to contact him, speaking, what have you, will all be there. And if you're following him, I'm sure you're going to get the first notification that that book is out. So we got to follow Chris. <laughs> yes, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully it's going to be in pre-marketing provided I do my job. It'll be, in, you know, start to pre-market in, uh, in, in, in February at some point. So it, it, one thing I do want to bring up, I, I want to hit it before um, we end this because I think it's really incredible. You have a passion for the uh, SPCA International. Mm -hmm. And you don't, yeah. you don't make that widely known. Why don't you talk about that for a second? Yeah, actually, so I, I talk about it in each presentation that I do. And um, so, and I appreciate you bringing it up. So I, I'm actually a huge animal rescue person, always have been. My family, oh my. that's all we ever did. Yeah. I mean, all about rescue from the time I was really young. My grandmother was really into it in the 70s before it was, you know, kind of everyone was doing it. She was really into it. And so we just learned from her. We learned from my mom about animal rescue. And so uh, I actually, there's a movie, Dead Poet Society from the 80s. Another lesson here, Robin Williams um, plays John Keating, the teacher at the elite private school. And he tells the kids, you know, there's the season day carpe diem everyone talks about. He says, no matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. And they can. In the palm of our hand now, we can actually do that. Back in the day, if I wanted my words and ideas to get out to the world, it was the Community Times newspaper in my little town of Reisterstown, Maryland. 13 people were going to read it. That's it. 
Now we can, you know, in the palm of our hand, we can get our words and ideas out, but it's really about action. So you can walk the walk, as they say, but you got to talk the talk. And for me, it's Animal Rescue. And my boy, Bodie, uh, I actually got from Wonder Paul's Rescue, which is a great rescue in Fort Lauderdale. And he actually came from the street. He was three months old, had dragged himself out to the sidewalk in Miami. He's a pit mix. He was basically one day from dying, uh, had bugs all over him. He was, he was dead. And a couple of cops scooped him up, took him to a rescue, Wonder Paul's. I watched his story. He had to learn how to walk again. It took about a month for him to walk. I saw a video of him walking, falling down, getting up, falling down, get so determined. And I knew he was my guy. And oh my um, at six months, I got him, never looked back. And uh, so I'm a huge advocate of animal rescue. That's my, you know, talk the talk, not just walk the walk. And the SPCA International, we got, I got involved with them. I was at a Salesforce conference a few years ago. I met the director. She told me about a program they had that reunited soldiers or people in the military with the dogs or cats that they had found on the battlefield or at the military base overseas. Wow. And they weren't able to bring them back. The military had these rules against it. They, they've loosened them since. And so what they do is they actually, they, they put those two together. So they work with the military to bring the dog or the cat back to the soldier. When the soldier is back in the U.S., they reunite the two so they can live their lives together because both of them probably have PTSD and it helps both of them with their lives. And I thought, this is what I want to donate to. So that's, that's, that's a beautiful story. And I bring it up. Um, I don't want to say just, just because of me, I truly love that because all of my dogs have been rescues and I rescue them from animal control and my dog Ford was and they estimated because they just find these dogs he was in mm -hmm. miami walking down the train tracks full of ticks and fleas and malnourished they thought maybe he was about four months old and uh at animal control you know they've got five days and that's it and but they do try to put the word out if there's an owner out there looking for the dog so i had to wait five days to see if an owner claimed him which was like oh having my finger <laughs> But yeah. I did get them, and now we're going on almost nine years, and I'm telling you, the dogs you rescue, they're just different. I think they know they've been rescued. He is a dream. He is my love. But So when I saw that you, you know, had a passion for that, I... I understood it because I do the same. I did. That's where I get my dogs. That's where I donate. So uh, you're a good man. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I... I... I'm a huge proponent of it. It's my thing. I never had kids. Um, so my legacy is going to be, you know, what I can leave behind for animal rescue and, you know, what footprint I leave behind in terms of um, the animals that I've helped to, to save. And um, I have one right now for those of you that are listening on my Facebook page, a friend of mine ended up with a pit mix in St. Pete. Her daughter dropped her off there. Her daughter found her somewhere in New York and brought her down and dropped her off to her mom. Her mom, Cannot keep the pit mix, um, has been trying to find a home for a month, does not want to take her to the SPCA. She will, but, you know, and it's safe there for a time being if they, unless they deem that, you know, the dog is aggressive, which she's not. Um, but she would much rather find a foster or, you know, a rescue with a foster. And so we've been trying together to find somebody. December 11th is the day that she's going to have to take her to the SPCA. Um, we're still desperately trying. If you're in St. Pete, um, please reach out to me and I will help you can help connect you to her. She's a great looking dog, year and a half old. Uh, I will definitely put that in the show notes too, to make it a little extra blurb. Not only will they hear it, it'll be there. The link to find you, everything will be there. Thanks. Appreciate that. Oh my. So I got asked, Chris, you got books, you got speaking engagements coming up. You're getting back into back out there to give us all our very enjoyable life lessons. What in the world do you think you're doing next beyond that? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm not really sure, to be honest. I think getting the third book out the door is my focus right now. The speaking gigs are my focus as well. Uh, I've been asked about creating a podcast, but I know, the, I know there's a lot of work that goes on the back oh, end, yeah. and I'm not sure I'm ready for it quite yet. Uh, to do a, uh, a podcast, but it remains to be seen. I mean, I'm definitely open to whatever comes my way. I just keep putting myself out there, talking 80s pop culture, talking about the lessons. And 
you know, you just keep putting yourself out there and, and try to open the doors as much as you can. And um, if people can see that you, you're passionate about something and that you love it, um, they want to know more about it. And we'll see where this leads me. I have no idea. It's going to be fun. I can tell you, you're going to have an awfully fun journey. I, I, I really hope so. And I, I would tell you, you talk about journey. Um, this is a really simple one, but uh, with, from Bill and Ted's, excellent adventure, you know, so um, I always tell people just listen, at the end of the day, just be excellent to each other. That's what, you know, Bill and Ted taught us, be excellent to each other. Um, too many people are not. So, you know, if you can be excellent to each other, that's probably um, the best lesson that we can get from 80s movies. Well, what better way to end this podcast? <laughs> be good to each other. Gosh, yeah. Chris, thank you so much. Chris Clues, the 80s pop culture guy. He's got two books, another one coming out. He speaks. He's, I, I, he does all sorts of writing, not just book writing, but I'll link you all up. Chris, I cannot thank you enough for being on Channel Confidential. I had so much fun. Um, I'm gonna, I just, makes me wanna just like, you know, when I get up, just go watch a bunch of 80s movies. But I'm very, very appreciative for you being on my podcast today and sharing what you do. It's really cool, a lot of fun. Well, thanks, Shannon. Again, I appreciate the megaphone. It means so much to me that you reached out and that we could do this together and that you work on the back end, like I said before, producing something, you know, independent, anything that you do independent, it's all you. And I know how much work goes into that. So I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. All right. Well, stay rad, everybody. <laughs>